Hi everyone and welcome to another Pro Tools tutorial. Following on from a previous video which I made about things to consider when moving Pro Tools sessions between systems, in this video I want to focus on the backup and archiving of completed sessions. It's a good idea to have a procedure in place which you follow whenever you finish working on a project. This should involve not only backing up the project in multiple locations, but also making provision for actually being able to access and open your sessions in years to come. So I'll briefly list my procedure for doing this and then I'll run through each of the points in more detail. So firstly, I'll commit any audio tracks on which I've used plugins which I think may not be available in the future. Then I'll do a save copy in. Next I'll open up that session copy and if required I'll compact the audio to reduce the overall size of the data I'm backing up. After that I'll usually save and close the session and drag it to my archive locations at least three of them. Next I'll open up the session from one of the archive locations just to make sure that it all still works okay. The sixth step would be to add the backup to my catalogue of backed up sessions. Finally, once I'm 100% happy that I've done all of the above, I'll delete the original version of the session from a hard drive. Some of these stages might not make complete sense yet, so we'll go through them one at a time in detail now, starting off with committing tracks. If you come back to a session at some point in the future, there's a reasonable chance that some of the plugins you used originally will no longer be available. In fact, over a long enough time period, it's a 100% certainty. Some of the sessions I backed up years ago used plugins which never made it across to AAX, or which were replaced with different ones. The old Avid EQ2 and Compressor 2 are examples. If I open an old session which used those plugins, they'll be inactive with no way to access them. So for this reason, it's a very good idea to commit any audio tracks on which you want to retain the processing. So for example, this voiceover track, I'll just run a little section of this. Away from all land, the ocean. It covers more than half the surface of our planet, and yet, for the most part, it's beyond our reach. Okay, well, that basically has two plugins on it. You can see we've got the Avid EQ3, which basically in this case acts as a high pass filter, and we've also got Channel Strip. I'm not quite sure why I use both, I could have done it all in Channel Strip. Uh, in this case, channel strip is has a little bit of EQ on it, and there's some compression on it as well. So I might choose to commit this audio track. So if I right-click the track name, choose Commit, and then you can see we have a variety of options. Now, I did go through this in a previous video, so I'll just mention the fact that in the case of a session which I'm about to back up, and I'm committing it so that I can access plugins in the future, I'd always choose to retain the original version of the track, as that gives me the option of going back to the unprocessed version if I need to as well. So in this case I might choose either Make Inactive, Hide and Make Inactive, or Do Nothing. Definitely don't choose Delete. I think just for the sake of this, I'll choose to Do Nothing, which means I'll have the committed track and the original, both on the timeline. Let's just start this going. That's going very quickly. And then once it's done, we've got both tracks, the uh, original version with the plugins and the processed version, which is the committed version. Uh, in fact, because this is quite a complicated session, as you can see, there's a lot of tracks in the project. If I come to this in the future, there's a high likelihood that I won't be able to remember what's on each track. So just to prevent any uncertainty, I might just put a comment on this track. So if I display the comments, uh, original voiceover track, I'll just put there's also a committed version. And then what I'll do with the committed version, only so that we don't get both of them playing simultaneously if I open this session in the future, I'll just actually hide and make it inactive. So the next step is to do a save copy in this is found under the file menu and allows you to save a copy of the session document along with all of its associated audio and video files if required. So I might choose that and that. Again, we have looked at this before so I'm going to skim over this quite quickly. One major benefit of this is that everything will be self-contained in one location. So if your session originally referenced audio files from a variety of locations on different hard drives, they'll be brought together into the audio files folder 
of the copied session. Also, if your original project was a cloud-based collaboration project, this will allow you to make a copy which is a standard, locally stored Pro Tools session. Save Copy In also prepares us for the next stage in the process, which is compacting audio. The compact command, found in the clip list menu, deletes unused portions of audio files, which allows you to basically conserve storage space. So firstly, I might just select all of the audio. Next, I'm going to go back to the clip list menu, choose compact. And you can see that we have the option of padding the audio with handles. So if clips in the session use crossfades, or if you think you might need to retrim some of the audio in the future, just enter an appropriate amount of padding here. The default is 1000 milliseconds, but I've previously used 500 and that's probably why it's come up here. So I'll stick with that for this. But before I actually set this in motion, let me just have a look at how big this session is. It's quite large, so this is the session folder, just get info. Okay, so it's 10.24 gigabytes. Um, I'm sure we can cut that down by a reasonable amount using compact. Let's give it a go, start that going. While that's going, I'll just mention the fact that another reason for saving a copy of the session before doing this process is to ensure that I don't inadvertently delete audio which is referenced from elsewhere. For example, this project contains a lot of sound effects, and if these were referenced from my sound effects drive, rather than being copied into the session audio files folder, compacting would actually delete all or part of the original file, which would obviously be permanent. And I use the word permanent because it is a destructive process, which can't be undone. So that's yet another reason for doing this to a copy of the session, rather than directly to the original session itself. One final point about compacting is that if you have any audio files in the clip list which you didn't actually use at all, then it's probably worth removing them before doing the compacting process. So you basically go to the clip list menu, you choose select unused, and then you could clear them out of the session. And at this point I just want to point something out which I've spotted in the Pro Tools reference guide which is actually outdated in the current version. So compacting an audio file it says, the compact command deletes unused portions of audio files to conserve disk space and to prepare for cleaner hard drive backups. The compact selected command also deletes any audio files for which there are no clips on tracks referencing those files. So what that means is if you've got a clip which is only in the clip list and you select it and choose to compact it, it'll delete it entirely. But that's not actually true. I think it probably was in a previous version, but certainly in the current Pro Tools software, if you select an unused audio file in the clip list and choose compact, it doesn't delete it, it just leaves it be. Anyway, our session's now compacted, so I'll just have a look in the operating system, and it's now reduced to dead on eight gigabytes. So that's a significant reduction in data size. Obviously this depends on how much of the audio you've used on the timeline and how much of it is not on the timeline, but it can be a convenient way just to reduce the size when you want to back it up. The next step is actually moving the session to your backup locations. Backing up a session to a single location on an external hard drive isn't sufficient. Hard drives and SSDs can fail, so you have to assume that any given drive could just stop working one day. The general recommendation for backing up data is to back it up in at least three places, with one of them being off-site. So I might back this up to an external drive, which I've got here. There's a few projects on there already. I'm just going to drag this over. And if I was doing this properly, I would drag this onto at least two other hard drives. I mentioned about one of the hard drives being off-site, so what I mean by that is basically don't keep it at your house, keep it somewhere else. This is in case of a major disaster such as flooding or fire. You could also use cloud storage for session backups too. Bear in mind that there's always a possibility that those cloud services might shut down without notice at some point, so never back up very critical data to just one cloud service. It's possible that you might still decide to burn a CD or a DVD of a session backup, although this is dying out very quickly and you might struggle to find drives for the disks in the future. I mention these formats though because they're read-only and so the data can't be accidentally overwritten. This would seem like a great way to ensure that your data is safe, but I've found that this isn't always the case. I backed up a load of Pro Tools sessions to CD and DVD between 1999 and 2000, and when I came back to them recently, many of them were no longer readable, and it was impossible to retrieve the data from them. I've looked into this, and it can be caused by a number of factors, including oxidisation or corrosion of the reflective layer, physical damage to disk surfaces or edges, galvanic reaction between layers and coatings, chemical reactions with contaminants, ultraviolet light damage, or the breaking down of disk materials, for example bonding of adhesives between layers. 
All of my discs were on a shelf in a room with no daylight and consistent temperature and humidity, so it had to be caused by a chemical breakdown of the discs themselves. I had about 250 disc backups to various brands of CDRs and DVDRs, and this is what I found regarding the long-term reliability. I'll just mention the three brands for which I had the most discs. TDK, I found those to be reasonably reliable, with some unreadable discs. Sony, they were very unreliable, with a very high failure rate. In fact, pretty much all of the Sony discs had some or all of the data being unreadable. Finally, Tyo Uden, these were 100% reliable, with all of the discs still readable. So that was about 70 discs, I think in my case, completely readable, zero failures. So based on my experience with this, I can only recommend Tyo Uden discs if you do still back up to CD or DVD, and you want your data to be accessible in the future. Anyway, let's move on to the next step, which is opening your backed up sessions. This might seem unnecessary, but I always open the sessions once I've moved them to a backup location, just to make sure that no errors or data corruption has occurred while moving the session. So I generally just open it, uh, just to make sure that everything's there. So just have a quick look around this. That's open fine. Everything looks okay. There were some missing audio files in the original, so I'm not going to worry too much about that. The backup is basically as it was when I saved it. That's fine. I'll just close it. So now we'll move on to the next step, which is adding the backed up session to an archive catalog. Pro Tools has a feature called Catalogs, and you'll find it in the Location section of a workspace browser. Catalogs allow you to create libraries of files which can be searched, even if the files are on a drive which is currently offline. So you can see that I've got an existing catalog here which references all of my sound effects. There's various folders within this actually. Searching a catalog is actually a lot quicker than searching the actual drive itself because it's basically a reference to the files and their metadata. If I right click here where it says catalogs, I've got the option of creating a new catalog. So I'm just going to start a new one which I'll call session backups. Okay, and to begin with, there'll be absolutely nothing in that catalog. And now I need to actually start adding things to the catalog. So I'm going to open another workspace browser just for convenience, navigate to this backup drive, see what we've got. And I'll just drag a few of these projects into that catalog because there's so few of them in this case, this is actually going to be a very quick process. I can open up the task manager. So it's only going to take a few seconds. And this is just referencing all the data about the data, the metadata basically. So that includes things such as file names, date modified, date created, bit depth, sample rate. In fact, let's just have a look at it. So that's already finished. If I go into this, you can see that everything which I just dropped into that is now displayed in the catalog. So for example, this project, which was the one we just looked at, Ocean Deep. If I have a look at this, go into the audio files folder. You can see that it's all referenced there. So we've got the date indexed, we've got file names. In fact, there's a variety of information which you can choose to display here. Some of them are already shown, or you can access the others by right-clicking on any given column header. And as you can see, there's a number of different attributes which you may or may not want to show. Okay, now I'm just going to show you a useful feature of this. So that's the catalog. That's the drive which it's on. In order to do this, I'm just going to have to quickly quit Pro Tools because it's uh, difficult to eject drives when you've got Pro Tools running. So do that, open up Pro Tools, and what you'll see is, even though that drive's no longer connected to this machine, I'll still be able to search through the contents of it, and it'll come up with the search results. Okay, so here we are in the catalog. Drive's not connected. Let's say I wanted to find the file which I knew was called VOComp. Okay, so VOComp. There you go. So you notice that it's in italics. Anything which is in italicized text is basically something which is on a drive which is not currently hooked up. So I can see all the attributes of it, I can see the duration. Obviously I won't be able to preview the file because it's not physically available at this time, but I can see all of the other associated metadata. One important thing is the path name. So this is a, a useful column to display. If I just expand this out a little bit. It tells me that it's on the volume which is called backup and then it's in the Ocean Deep Mix folder. So all I'd need to do is remount that drive and that would become available. In fact, it can do even more than that. If I, let me just show you this. If I create a new project, I'll just give it the name new. What you'll see is that I'm actually still, even though the files are offline, I'm still able to import this 
into the project or into the session. So if I drop this in, it tells me that it's not available. That's fine for now, so I'm just going to skip. And then it will at least be in there as an offline file. And the good thing about this is, when that drive becomes available again, Pro Tools will automatically recognize that the file's there, and it should import it automatically. So that's almost everything. The final stage would be simply to delete the original session. Once all of the backup procedure is done, and you're completely happy that your data is backed up and safe, you can delete the original. I have a drive which I work off, and others which are purely for backup. In fact, the work drive itself should be backed up. I use a RAID setup configured as RAID 5. This is probably a story for another time, but it's basically an array of hard drives which appear as one and provide data redundancy in the case where one of the drives fails. The data can basically be rebuilt from the data on the other drives. Anyway, that's almost it for this video on backing up and archiving Pro Tools sessions. There's just one final thing to mention. Every so often, Avid changes the Pro Tools session format. At the moment it's PTX, before that it was PTF, and before that it was PTS. There were even others before that. It's probably reasonable to assume then that in some future version of Pro Tools, the session format will change yet again. Backwards compatibility is maintained for several versions, but it would still be a good idea to open archived sessions periodically and resave them in the current format. So here's an old PTF session. Let's see what happens when I open this. Firstly, it's telling me about some different outputs because I last opened it with a different audio interface. Next, this is no surprise, we've got some missing plugins. This is what I'm talking about. You probably have this kind of issue. I'll just ignore that for now. It's missing the audio files. That's because I've moved this since the last time I opened it. So I'll probably just choose automatically find and relink. This might take a couple of minutes. So let's just skip to the point where it's done. Okay, so you can see that it's now mostly done. You'll notice from these little red indicators that there are some missing files. In fact, there's one of them. Maybe I didn't follow my own backup procedure. Uh, I could probably spend time trying to find that file, but for the purposes of this, I just want to mention the fact that this is still uh, in the old PTF format. What I need to do is save this. So I could just do... In fact, if I just do save, it will actually prompt me to give it a name. I could keep the original name. I might just call it PT12 to indicate that it's a Pro Tools 12 version of it. Okay, and then go back to here and you can see that that's now there. So I didn't actually have to do a save copy in and uh, go through the process of copying all the audio files. All I had to do is open the session and then just do a save and it's created a PTX. Because these are so small in file size, you might as well just keep these just in case you need to go back to them at any point in the future. Well, that's it for this video. Thanks to everyone who has watched and subscribed to my channel. Let me know if you have any suggestions for future videos, especially post-production focused ones. I'll see you again soon.